morning, Chief Justice. Uh, good morning, esteemed commissioners. Are you well or as uh, nervous as most of us were when we appeared before this body? You can never get rid of the nerves, Chief Justice. All right, okay, we'll, we'll start well. Why did you uh, pursue a master's program <coughs> after <laughs> completing LLB? At the time when I pursued my master's degree, I was in private practice, and um, I saw the need to improve my qualifications. And at the time, I was actively involved in the community um, in terms of pro bono work. And one of the areas that I was specifically concerned about was the position of juveniles. And then I decided to pursue my master's degree in uh, juvenile justice, uh, focusing on the restorative aspect uh, of juvenile justice. Uh, I did comp a comparative analysis and compared it to other countries uh, in terms of whether the approach towards uh, juvenile justice should be a legal approach or a welfare approach. But that flowed, my topic flowed from my work in the community because at the time there was no proper structure as to how government dealt with juveniles and the structure only um, came in later in terms of assessing juveniles, etc. So that was my topic that I chose, but the main purpose was also self-development, Chief Justice. Yes. <laughs> and um, for how many years did you practice as an attorney? Chief Justice, I practiced as, as an attorney for 15 years of which I practiced for my own account for 14 years. Yes. And uh, just on a lighter note, did you make a lot of money? It looks like there really is some money in private practice. Well, at the time, money wasn't the main motivation. But uh, it, it just fortune just happened to smile at you and uh, you made it? Yes, Chief Justice, although it wasn't the main motivation at the time but it worked out well. Yes. And um, you were a member of uh, Nadal and, and BLA. Were you a member of the two bodies at the same time, or did you abandon one and go for the other? Well, Chief Justice, uh, at my first, first interview uh, as a judge, I was asked that question, and I will, my answer will remain the same. I crossed the floor. From where to where? From Nadal to BLA. So I was, uh, I was along with Nadal, and then of course your colleagues that you interact with, that you mix with, the circles that you move in. Uh, then I moved from Nadal around about um, 1999 uh, to BLA. Did you think they were not sufficiently radical or what? <laughs> One can say that. But it's also a matter of associating with the people that were closest to you at the time, Chief Justice. Yes. Now, <clears throat> since when did you become a member of the South African chapter of the International Women uh, Judges Association? Chief Justice, um, I acted in the Northern Cape in 2004. Yes. And I got to know about the organization. I think that was more or less the time when it started. And um, I heard about the organization, but I officially joined the organization in 2006 on my appointment. Is it strong? Is it focused? Or is it uh, still developing itself? Where is it? The organization. Um, the founding members were very senior uh, women judges. Like Judge President Leo. I think that's she correct. served in the first executive. That's correct. And Judge yes. Lucy Malula. Yes, Judge she was Khan, president. Just, uh, president Maya. Yes. Uh, it started out very strong. And? and um, uh, its focus was obviously to, 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 uh, on the development and advancement of women uh, in the judiciary as well as other, uh, other issues affecting uh, women and vulnerable women in society. So it started out strong, and um, throughout the years, uh, there were some problems, I must say. Uh, I've been faithful to the organization. I've stayed a member. I uh, also occupied the position uh, of uh, treasurer, Tre treasurer for two yes. terms. Yes. yes. 
But I, I would say that the organization is flourishing yes. and they're active. There's a great sense of activism within the organization in terms of mentoring students, um, dealing with uh, domestic violence issues, HIV AIDS. So um, I think the organization has sort of undergone some sort of revival as I speak now, Chief Justice. Yes, with President Maya that's, as its president. That's correct. Yes. Now tell me, um, you're a beneficiary of a particular program that has been run in the Northern Cape Division of the High Court. Uh, Northern Cape was uh, in, a, in, a pos in, a, in a position, in a unique position. It had some funding from the Ministry to Develop Women. And um, you, you were there for, for a continuous period of how many years? Um, Chief Justice, I was not a beneficiary of a specific program. Yes. I was identified by uh, JP Diali Homo. Yes. So I was a beneficiary of a specific uh, project that he ran in terms that, of yes. empowering women. I'm not sure what the exact details is, where it comes from, etc. But I was part of uh, the uh, 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 JP Homo's initiative yes. to empower women and to prepare them for, for positions uh, in the judiciary. Um, uh, JP Homo is, is my mentor, yes. and I started out there uh, in a small division, which I think was a very good thing. Yes. And there I could thrive and I could grow. And then from there, I uh, acted in the Eastern Cape, and, um, and thereafter I was appointed at the Western Cape. Yeah. That, that's the particular program I'm talking about. Yes. Uh, because I think, to the best of my recollection, only he. Uh, had the opportunity to train uh, uh, aspirant women judges on a continuous basis with the benefit of funding from the ministry, which was a very successful program. Justice uh, Mokotla is, uh, is, uh, uh, comes from that program, Justice Mutumi also, and you, and I, I suspect you know the only ones. That is correct, uh, Chief Justice. There were, we were quite a number of women Yes. Uh, on that program. Now, you've been uh, a high court judge for some 12 or 13 years, isn't it? 13 years, uh, just over 13 years, Chief Justice. 13 years and three months to the day. Yes. And when did you become the deputy judge president? I became the deputy judge president the 1st of July 2016, uh, but I started to act as a Deputy Judge President on the 18th of April, 2016. So you took over from Deputy Judge President uh, Jeanette Traverso. That is correct, Chief Justice. How did you <laughs> manage to, to rise to that level in that big uh, division that seems to even be male-dominated? Chief Justice, uh, I think it's a matter of um, your passion for your work, and uh, good interpersonal relationships, good relationships with the judge president, being collegial to all um, colleagues. Um, it was an honor and a privilege for me to be appointed to that position, uh, Chief Justice. Um, and having been um, in private practice for 14 years, the transition uh, from an ordinary judge, if I, can, if I can use the term ordinary judge, to deputy judge president was fairly um, easy. Yes. <coughs> now, what is this about gun control in May 20, uh, 2004 now that you, had, that you published an article about? Briefly, what is it about gun control that you saw the need to say something about? Yes, at the time, there were no fixed um, laws or regulations in terms of uh, gun control and um, the, uh, it was sort of high on the agenda at that time and even up till today gun control is a controversial topic uh, in South Africa and also uh, particularly in America. So uh, my interest flowed from at the time I think there were proposals around gun control um, and I then analyzed it and uh, gave uh, 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 my take on, on, on the position with regard to gun, gun control at that time. Yes. You 
you have acted to the Constitutional Court. For, for how many terms was it? I acted for four terms, Chief Justice. Yes. And um, you've had uh, occasion to produce some judgments? That is correct. Yes. Now, you look like you're settled now. Yes, Chief Justice. All right. Um, there is a, a concern raised about your decision in a quasi-judicial capacity, really, as a member of the JCC. Do you want to say anything about it? Not the merits, but uh, do you think it's something that uh, this forum needs to deal with? Does it belong elsewhere? What do you want to say? Chief Justice. I was designated uh, to attend to a specific matter in my capacity as a member of the JCC. I the, judicial the Judicial Conduct Committee, Conduct Committee that which entertains complaints. That is correct. Yes. I dealt with the matter to the best of my ability in terms of the rules. Yes. And I arrived at a decision. I made yes. a ruling in this matter. And as far as I am concerned, I'm functus officio. Yes. If anyone is aggrieved by any decision that I have made, they do have the option to appeal or take the matter on review. Within the, uh, within the uh, structures of the Judicial that, Conduct Committee. That's correct, Chief Justice. And if they are unhappy, I assume they can take the matter on review. Exactly. So yes. I'm functus officio. I have yes. done my part. Yes. Now tell me, uh, Deputy Judge President, why do you believe that uh, <laughs> you you ought to be one of those to be recommended for appointment. Just break a bit. Uh, uh, you may never have another opportunity to break openly because uh, the dictates of humility don't, don't permit. Chief Justice and Commissioners, I believe that my, my experience cumulatively in the legal profession over the years put me in good stead, having been an attorney for, for 15 years and having been in private practice for 14 years um, and thereafter a judge for a period of 13 years, I have acquired quite a number of skills. No one is perfect, you don't know everything, but I think that um, that the period uh, uh, while in private practice, coupled with my period uh, in the judiciary, um, has equipped me to a certain extent. Um, as a judge, I have dealt with, uh, 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 with a broad range of matters. And as a DJP, I could grow further in court administration. The Western Cape High Court is a big division to run. Um, in addition to that, my experience, having acted for four terms in the constitutional uh, court uh, also um, adds to my uh, abilities, abilities. Um, and um, my experience uh, in the constitutional court has strengthened my understanding of the vision of the constitution. It has deepened my understanding of the vision, the transformative vision of the Constitution. And I do believe that I will be in a position, I'm confident I will be in a position to contribute positively to our constitutional jurisprudence. Now tell me, um, when you assumed the, the DJP ship responsibilities, did you, did you experience challenges in relation to your capacity to deliver as DJP considering this, the size and the, and the workload of the division? Chief Justice, as mentioned earlier, I ran my own practice for 14 years. So the transition was fairly easy for me. What I can add is that the main thing that assisted me to perform efficiently and effectively um, almost from the word go was the support from the judge president. He graciously transferred his skills to me, which assisted me to settle in quicker and to get on with, with the job. 
Have you people been able to implement judicial case management properly? Does it work? Chief Justice, uh, the, West, the Western Cape Division has been actively involved in case flow management. Um, uh, Judge Traversa was very much um, also involved there. And in my capacity as DJP, I automatically chair the practice committee. So yes, I personally was actively involved in case flow management as chairperson of the practice committee, and of course, overseeing our practice uh, notes and updating it, etc., and giving guidance when needed, and formulating new rules when needed. Thank you, colleagues. Commissioner Msomi. Thanks, CJ. Good morning, Judge Goliath. Good morning. Judge Goliath, I'm going to refer you to a paragraph. It's paragraph 12.3 of the comment by the GCP yes. in respect of your candidature. Basically what is said there, and I'm inviting your comment on it, is that there has been a negative media commentary on the length of delays in handing down judgments by certain judges in the Western Cape High Court. <coughs> Whether this should reflect adversely on the candidate is unclear. But I think the question gets raised within the context of you being the second in charge there. Is that a fair comment that there has been negative media commentary on the end of delays there? Commissioner, I was acting in the Constitutional Court for a, for, for a whole year last year, from January until December. And uh, thereafter, I was on long leave. So I have not been in the division uh, for a year and a term. Um, so what the current position is with regard to um, reserve judgment, I cannot comment on that. But I will, uh, in my capacity of DJP, I will take some sense of responsibility to the extent that um, while I was DJP there, I, um, I did take control of uh, the reserve judgment list. And uh, Chief Justice and Commissioners, I just need to inform you that when I arrived there, that uh, uh, list was the duty of the DJP. The DJP is responsible to compile that list. And I discovered that not all the cases were recorded. And I then, um, uh, and perhaps I should just pause, Chief Justice, I am in, uh, talking in my capacity as a deputy judge president, so whatever I say is always in consultation with the judge president. I just need the commissioners to understand that. So I uh, had a memo circulated to the profession to say that if there's any cases not recorded, they're welcome to contact me. And that flowed from another issue when I started as a DJP, was that queries were being directed to the registrar about reserve judgments. And I immediately changed it and said, no, they cannot query a judgment through the registrar. It must be queried through the judge president or myself. And the judge president and I agreed that from now onwards, it will be cha channeled through to me. So in that sense, I do take responsibility. I also had a hand, what, when, uh, this is now more than a year ago, I had a hands-on approach with regard to reserve judgments. I would phone colleagues personally. I would walk to the chambers personally. and. My duty is then to report to the judge president what is going to happen, how did they commit themselves, whether the colleague needs more time to, 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 um, to write judgments, and then the judge president would then, I would actually compile a file, discuss it with the judge president, and then he would then decide on the way forward in those matters. As I understand it, you have a name and shame system. You, you put the, the names of those who haven't finalized their judgments within a, a certain period on the notice board for all to see. That is correct, uh, Chief Justice. It's a very transparent system. No, there is no way to hide. Thanks, CJ. Um, at, the, at the risk of attacking, uh, of receiving an attack from Mr. Singh <laughs> for, for reading the Daily Maverick, I came across a very <laughs> Good article the other day. It was penned by Professor Baltazar. I hope I'm pronouncing his or her surname correctly. Professor Baltazar makes this following comment. 
in his or her article, because I don't know whether he's a female or, fem or, or a male. One, there's a reference, this person makes reference to controversies concerning constitutional court judgments. And then this person proceeds to say, let's hear your views on the criticism leveled against the Jacobs judgment, which you penned, where the court deadlocked. <laughs> and I think the, the issue that is being raised is whether it is, for the lack of a better word, is it all right for the apex court to deadlock, or should we be having firm and clear decisions when matters get to the constitutional court? Uh, Chief Justice, Commissioners, yes, um, regret, I, I don't know whether I should use the word regrettable, but yes, it is regrettable if there is a split decision. But split decisions are nothing new, and I'm talking about even internationally. Um, our democracy is still young, so we are going to progress and we are still going to learn a lot of lessons. And. For some, in some, some quarters may frown upon it. Uh, Chief Justice and uh, c uh, Commissioners, I have considered that uh, uh, question. Now, in English law, they, uh, uh, call, uh, they develop what they call, a, 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 it's a rule of affirmance, uh, which happened in Jacob's case. Um, the rule says, if there's a split decision, uh, then the, the decision of the lower court is affirmed, and that is exactly what happened in, in, in Jacobs. Now, that, that rule has its roots in English law many, many, many years ago. The Supreme Court in the USA, um, uh, uh, the, it's the highest court in the federal system, it dealt with, with the occasional problem of a split vote for more than 100 years. And between the years 1925 to 2015, there has in fact been 164 Thai votes in the US Supreme Court alone. So they call it a split decision, a Thai, or a divided, uh, an equal division as in English law. Um, Chief Justice and Commissioners, I think we, we, we are taking baby steps to get there. It is a normal phenomenon. Um, sometimes judges will get fall ill. Judges will have to recuse itself. Our minimum quorum is eight. Uh, in the US, it's nine. So you get recusals. You get judges who are ill. And inevitably, a split vote can result in it. Um, so uh, commissioners and chief justice, um, I don't have any problem with that decision. It is globally acceptable, and it is not a strange phenomenon at all. So the long and short of it is that the South African public should not be worried at exactly. all. Exactly. The last question, because we are all allocated three questions only. Oh, I thought it was three. I saw. Oh. <coughs> Chief Justice, may I have you? You, you may put your question. It's two. Oh, it's only the minister. Oh, no, okay. no, no. The, the minister was uh, riding on grace. Uh, he knows that I'll stop him. Uh, I hope he, he, he stays warned. But I uh, just thought I must be gracious uh, towards him as I'm being towards you. Chief Justice, I'm indebted. Mm. And, and what is your conception of the principle of separation of powers? I mean, I'm not looking for a for a dictionary meaning of, of that concept. But perhaps are you able to refer us to a judgment where we have been able to grapple and balance that question in your approach in adjudicating where the law begins and ends and where, and where politics begins? Thank you, Chief Justice. Well, the separation of powers doctrine recognizes the functional independence uh, of branches of government. But of course, no constitutional structure uh, has uh, makes provision for complete separation. And um, 
because of the system of checks and balances, it anticipates an intrusion of one branch uh, on the terrain of another, and that is specifically the judiciary, who is the ultimate guardian of our constitution. And section 172 mandates the court to declare any conduct um, or law that is inconsistent with the constitution as invalid to the extent of its consistency. So yes, the judiciary has an oversight function over the other two arms of state. Um, okay, when, when cases comes to mind, um, um, I'm thinking of national treasury perhaps um, in terms of the tolling decision uh, which involved policy decisions where the Khan court decided it is not for a court to decide on policy with regard to tolling. Um, but ultimately, the judiciary must be mindful of the limits of its powers. And the judiciary must be mindful not to overreach. And the judiciary must be mindful to defer to the other arms of state when needed and when matters calls for it, uh, such as po policy decisions or political decisions, the judiciary must be mindful to show due deference to the other arms of state. Well, for what it is worth, uh, Deputy Judge President, somebody forwarded to me another article that Commissioner Amsomi is referring to, but a comment on it, uh, I think on a daily maverick, as uh, somebody saying there is a trend which almost looks like a campaign to gratuitously attack me. And on that uh, occasion, it was being said there was a tie because I was not sitting. And he's saying, but the minimum is eight judges. And the person was saying, we must uh, wage a, a fight back because there is a concerted effort here to discredit the Chief Justice. I think that's, uh, that flowed from uh, the article that Commissioner Msomi is referring to. Uh, <clears throat> quite frankly, I read these academic commentaries sparingly because some of them you don't know what, whether there is an agenda or not. Commissioner Nyambi. Uh, thanks, CJ. Morning, TJP. Good morning. Taking it from the last question by Honorary Commissioner Msomi, the issue of separation of powers. Will you say the 2015 case between Tlowama and others versus the Speaker of the National Assembly, whose judgment you wrote, yes. clarifies your understanding of the doctrine? Um, uh, uh, Commissioner, uh, Chief Justice, in that matter, I did quite a lot of research on the separation of powers. Um, and um, I think I gave a clear uh, uh, exposition of how it functions and um, what the role of the courts are and um, uh, with reference to due deference to other arms of states. I think I gave a clear exposition of how it functions, uh, how it should function and uh, that the court should be wary of not um, uh, usurping the domain of the other two arms of state. Maybe you are missing my question. My question is that, uh, will, you st will you still uh, say your understanding in that judgment clarify uh, uh, the, the issue of uh, separation of powers? Well, I've just given a general exposition uh, uh, um, in, in that matter. Um, I'm, I, I don't... Uh, uh, understand the question, but I know there was the United Democratic Movement versus the Speaker, the National Assembly judgment subsequently in the Constitutional Court. Um, and I don't know if you're referring to that case if, uh, in terms of, uh, are you linking Ma Tulama to that case? No, I'm interested in your understanding in relation to that case that you, you wrote. Well, that case involved the removal of the Speaker, and I found that the courts are not authorized to get involved in the removal of the Speaker. And I think Rule 102 was also attacked, and I made a ruling on that as well. So um, I'm satisfied that I dealt ad adequately with the issue, uh, uh, particular to that specific case. I felt I dealt adequately 
uh, uh, with the issue of separation of powers. If you can share with us your <coughs> view about the uh, transformation of a judiciary in our beloved country, South Africa. Um, there are constitutional imperatives in terms of transforming our judiciary. We want a diverse judiciary. We want a, a, a judiciary that uh, caters for women, that caters for all races. I think is, is it section 165, if I'm not mistaken. There are imperatives in terms of transformation. And transformation is not just something that is just, uh, that should just be taken at face value. It's about mindsets, how you approach cases, how you approach matters, and an understanding of where we come from as a country and where we want to head to, where do we want to go in terms of redressing our history, in terms of addressing um, uh, uh, socioeconomic rights and issues of equality. So one must have a transformative mind. If that is where true transformation lies. Not just mere saying, oh, I'm, I, 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 I believe in transformation. It's something that must be put in action and you must be able to show it as well. Thanks, DJP. Thank you, Chief Justice. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Nyambi. Uh, Commissioner Norman. Thank you, Chief Justice. Uh, good morning, DJP. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I'm just following up on the question that uh, Commissioner Msome asked. I uh, couldn't understand clearly your answer. Um, the question that related to the high number of reserve judgments in, yes. in your division. Yes. Um, is uh, the DJP back at uh, at the Western Cape High Court, or are you still acting at the Constitutional Court? I've been away for the whole of last year. That is a year, and I'm currently on long leave. And I've, so I've been away for a year and a term, which amounts to 18 months. So, in, and then um, is there someone acting in your position currently? That is correct, Commissioner. Uh, Judge Desai has been acting since I... Uh, started to act in the Constitutional Court. And when do you come back from long leave? 15th of April. All right. Okay, thank you. And then, um, so in other words, we have not been in touch then with what's happening within the division for 18 months? No, not at all, Commissioner. But I do say, as DJP, uh, uh, remotely at the moment, I do take responsibility uh, to the extent that we do actively try to encourage judges, yes. and I can speak on behalf of the judge president as well. Yes. We do take active steps to encourage judges to finish their judgments. Yes, thank you. Yes. I see in the judgment that you penned, the Discovery versus Sunlam judgment, yes. uh, deals with trademark um, That's correct. Uh, issues. Um, have you been exposed to a lot of commercial litigation, and have you written judgments um, that deal with mainly or largely with, with commercial matters, other than the one that I've just yeah. referred you to? Well, in, in, in motion court, we deal with sequestrations and liquidations all the time. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to find my, my form. Um, I have mentioned um, a case, the case of Inkelden that was taken on appeal. Yes. That was also a trademarks case. Uh, it should be on my list where it's one of the matters that was confirmed on appeal. And then I, I also wrote another trademark uh, matter, um, Southern um, Liquors. Uh, uh, I, I have the citation here. Uh, yes. It's also a trademarks matter. And the reason why I specifically remember this case, it involved Amarula, which is a popular wine in South Africa, and the company was... Um, um, passing off their bottles as being connected to the Amarula uh, yes. uh, uh, bottle with a tree, etc. And colleagues who used to come in and make fun of me seeing all the wine bottles there because they knew I'm a non-drinker. So I have had exposure to, yes. to, to, to trademarks matters. Discovery is actually the last one I wrote. I've had exposure to, to, to trademarks before Discovery. And as you will see, Discovery is actually a very detailed judgment. I did quite a lot of research in that case yes. uh, in terms of the, 
the issues in dispute. But yes, that is not my only trademark case. No, thank you. And I, I see that you've also written an article, if I'm correct. That on is the, correct. On, on also on trademarks yes. sometime in 2015. Yes, that is correct. It's yes. a, a, entitled Genericide, Death of a Trademark. Because when, after the discovery case, I was so fascinated, uh, my research showed that a trademark can actually uh, lose its relevance. It's called gen gen uh, genericide, you know. Uh, if it becomes, if a trademark becomes generic, yes. it is useless because it's then used in the ordinary course of the English language, and then it loses its uh, uh, um, title, its status as a trademark. So I was quite fascinated by that, yes. especially when you look at discovery. It was escalator fund versus escalating fund, and those are common words in the English vocabulary. So um, that prompted me to write that article because it was quite interesting to say, oops, uh, you mustn't uh, uh, look at the word Hoover or um, Kellogg's, uh, uh, etc. to think that you can coin a, 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 a name and the name can lose its significance if it becomes part of the normal language. Yes. So yes, that, is, that article was written based on my cumulative experience in trademarks. Yes, so if one were to ask you then, uh, what is the unique skill that you wish to bring to the Constitutional Court? Uh, I would imagine your answer would be the trademarks uh, experience or expertise. Most certainly, Commissioner. Yes, thank you. And then lastly, if you, Chief Justice, the first question was a follow-up, thank <laughs> you. Um, <laughs> So we're still on the one. <laughs> this is my second one. Thank you, thank you, Chief Justice. Um, the, you've written um, uh, uh, DJP at an article on human trafficking, and I read that article, and um, I just wanted to know whether you believe there is a link at all between human trafficking and the adoption processes that our country follows. Look, human trafficking is a hidden crime. And it is something that you cannot really find statistics for, especially in South Africa. And that article tells you that uh, the question is, oh, is South Africa doing enough? I don't think one can ever do enough with, when, with the poorest borders that we have. Yeah. So children are vulnerable uh, of being uh, trafficked. In South Africa, we do have checks and balances in place, and were you referring to adoptions now? Yes, uh, yeah. in, especially inter-country yeah. adoptions. Yeah, inter-country yes. adoptions, I think we have the Hague Convention, we have checks and balances in place. Um, I would, my personal view is that the current system in South Africa mm. um, makes it difficult to traffic children. Where I see the problem is, um, in the southern African region, coming from uh, Mozambique or Lesotho or Swaziland, that is uh, where I see problems. But ultimately, I think we do have sufficient checks and balance to, to, to uh, avoid child trafficking, um, even in terms of immigration laws and uh, children uh, deal when you have children traveling in and out of the country. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Joseph. <coughs> Thank you, Commissioner Norman. Commissioner Mbofu. <coughs> Thank you. Good morning, uh, TJP. Good morning. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm just going to ask you two things. One is um, a, a follow-up on the, on the complaint that the Chief Justice referred to. Um, I, I do appreciate your answer that <laughs> it's a matter that is, that is within the pipeline or in the system as, as such, um, and therefore you know, whether your approach was right or wrong will be determined by somebody else, yes. as, as it should, yeah. But my understanding of the, of the complaint <coughs> was, uh, and, and this is why I want to give you an opportunity just to allay the fears of the complainants. Yes. Uh, my sense is that th there's a feeling that, um, you remember that the complaint in question re involves a judge. That's correct. Yes. And I think that's where the, the, the issues need to be clarified. Because, you know, just taking from my own experience as a, a former chair of the Johannesburg Bar Council, whenever we have, there's a complaint against an advocate, uh, you know, members of the public, particularly if we exonerate that advocate, there's always this lingering thing that, oh, well, you know, 
it's one of you, therefore you are always going to find them yes. not guilty and so on. Yes. So I think it is that kind of, of, of issue. So um, <clears throat> the, the, the issue that was raised was the approach that you had taken as opposed to the approach that was recommended, uh, if I remember well, by the, by the original panel. Whether the decision is right or wrong or whatever, mm -hmm. can you give uh, an assurance that, as you had said earlier, it was a decision taken to the best of your ability uh, in the proper discharge of, of your duties and not influenced by the fact that um, you, know, you were dealing with a, matter, a complaint against uh, one of your colleagues, so to speak? Uh, Chief Justice and Commissioner, the, the whole uh, um, disciplinary system, it is a peer review system. So inevitably, you will find some of your colleagues at fault and some not, and I do not hesitate to do that. We have found colleagues at fault and we have ruled against colleagues. What happened in this specific case, and I'm specifically referring to the decision of the two previous um, uh, members, panelists. I personally called for further submissions. I had more information in front of me than the two of them had. And I applied my mind to the whole body of the facts and to all the documents that were presented before me. So I can assure the commissioners that there was a difference in what was before the two initially and what was before me that prompted me to analyze the matter based on the facts objectively and arrive at the conclusion which I did. Thank you. Um, then the second one is uh, uh, a, a question which you may or may not want to entertain. I just was, as a matter of interest, uh, uh, one of your judgments which you have attached here is the judgment in the Kawama case. Yes, that's right. Now, as you know that the, in the secret ballot uh, decision yes. of the UDM, <laughs> that um, decision was over 10 yes. uh, to, to an extent, at yes. least to the extent of the, or uh, to the extent that you found that the Speaker of Parliament yes. does not have the discretion to order a secret ballot. That's right. Um, <laughs> now I know uh, all of us, if uh, your judgment is overturned, you, you either accept it or think that uh, they got it wrong, the other people got it wrong. Yes. That's not what I'm asking you for. I'm asking whether, uh, given the, the uh, you must have taken some special interest in the outcome of the UDM case. Yes, I did. And um, did you, do you accept now that, the, uh, that your approach uh, might have been incorrect or, or uh, less, less um, daring. Yes. Or, or, yeah. Yes, I do accept that. What I said in my judgment is that the rules does not provide for secret ballot simply because you don't find the word secret ballot in the rules. I looked for the word secret ballot. It's not there. Um, I know it is being interpreted as if I said it can never happen, and I'm not arguing with that. If there was such an understanding, I think I don't agree with that understanding, but I understand where that understanding comes from because I said the rules does not provide for a secret ballot. Uh, and as I've explained, it's because the word secret ballot is not mentioned anywhere. But I do refer to rule 2.1 in my judgment where the speaker has a discretion to deal with matters not covered by the rules. I did refer to section 57, which says that the National Assembly is the master of its own processes. And if you are the master of your own processes, surely you can provide for, 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 for a situation of a secret ballot. But be it as it may, what the Con Constitutional Court did, it brought in rule 104, which I omitted in my judgment, which, and, this, and the Constitutional Court then clarified that that rule, Rule 104, allows for the Speaker to predetermine a manual voting system that may not permit a recordal or disclosure of the names. So the Constitutional Court then uh, uh, clarified that aspect where I erred in Tolama because I didn't clarify that aspect because I was looking for the word secret ballot in the rules. But 
in the, by the rule 104, as the constitutional found, by implication, includes a secret ballot. Okay. Thank, thank you, Chief Justice. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Mbofu. Commissioner Schmidt. Thank you, Chief Justice. Um, there's been a certain amount of debate this morning and yesterday about the possible merger, if I could call it that, between the Constitutional Court and the ACA. Yes. And part of that is whether constitutional law is a separate branch of the law and or whether it is, by lack of a better word, interwoven with other branches of the law. Your views on that? I, I would think that um, constitutional law could be very much uh, be interwoven with other branches of the law. Um, you know, with the 17th Amendment, the jurisdiction of the Constitutional Court has in any event been extended to matters of public importance, uh, uh, arguable points of law of public importance. Um, so yes, I agree with you. One can say it is infused with other areas as well. Thank you, Honorable Schmidt. Uh, Commissioner Singh. Uh, thank you, uh, Chief Justice, and good morning, uh, DJP. Good morning. Now, I think it is common knowledge that uh, you found yourself uh, presiding over many high-profile criminal cases. That's right. And uh, we've read some of these uh, findings and judgments. <coughs> now, one of that is where you convicted uh, a well-known artist, as well as Tum Tetwa. That's correct. Now, now, what was quite disturbing there is that, firstly, and I'm not saying it's your fault or the judiciary's <laughs> fault, it took four years before that matter was concluded. And uh, secondly, you know, you did say that there were numerous delays. That's now, correct. given the fact that uh, statistics show that from uh, April 2017 to March 2018, yes. there were 57 <laughs> murders a day in South Africa. And these here were heinous crimes, you know, uh, that were committed uh, by, by uh, um, Tetwa. Yes. And given that the Western Cape records the highest in terms of murders, and you come from there. Yes. What are we missing? What's going wrong? Uh, and, you know, how can we provide better comfort to families of victims in ensuring that, you know, justice is meted out as swiftly as possible? Uh, and I'd like a response from you first as a judicial officer and then as, as, as a citizen of that particular area and a citizen of South Africa, what are we missing? What's going wrong and what can be done? Thank you. Uh, Chief Justice, Commissioner, sometimes you think that the investigations have been completed in the matter. The case goes through case flow management and it ends up in the High Court. And then the legal representatives all of a sudden raise issues in the matter. And particularly the matter of uh, Ms. Mtetwa raised medical issues. Um, I know there was quite a lot of publicity every time the matter was postponed. Um, I was not involved in the initial postponement, but eventually when it was allocated to me, it was also postponed again. Um, I think the solution lies in a combination of proper case flow management of high profile cases and dealing properly with the legal representatives who deal with these matters. Because inevitably, problems crop up once the, the legal representatives get appointed, you're ready to run trial. I've been ready to start that trial. And then all of a sudden, the parties say, we have, we've reached this obstacle, that obstacle. And as the judicial officer, you cannot also enter into ter the terrain of each and every obstacle because you must also remain neutral and allow the parties to solve their problem because it might impact on the merits of the case or there's some dispute about something. Um, in terms of dealing with, um, in terms of comforting the public, I can say at the Western Cape High Court, we work very closely with the DPP, the National Prosecuting Authority, and our mandate is to serve the public efficiently, effectively, and that we do to the best of our ability. And if a matter is postponed, such as that particular matter, it is very seldom the problem 
from on the side of the judiciary. The, judi the judiciary is ready to proceed and the media articles will attest to that. So there are some other internal problems that could be outside the ambit of the judiciary, but as I say, depending on who the legal representatives are, they raise issues, and that can also then cause delays in the matter. Thank you, uh, DJP. You say in the Western Cape you have this interaction. Now, are you aware of this kind of interaction in other jurisdictions, and, or maybe the Chief Justice can assist us in that regard, uh, you know, to answer these delays? And then we as members of the public, you know, say, but why? Five years, six years, more than that sometimes. Why are these delays? So firstly, the question to you, and then maybe the Chief Justice would want to come in. Thank you. I'm not aware of other problems because the Western Cape Division, is, is, it's, it's a well-oiled machine. The division is run very, very well by the Judge President. And with my support, uh, we try to um, dispense justice swiftly and fairly. I'm not aware of other problems, but I do know that um, when the problems arise, it has got nothing to do with the judiciary not taking proactive steps to have a matter proceed and commence with as soon as possible. Well, isn't this where the, the solution really lies? <clears throat> Last year in my engagement with the the top brass of the French police and their judiciary, which is a combination of the prosecutors and judges, what emerged was there is no serious case or potentially complicated case that is investigated by the police to the exclusion of a lawyer. As a result, they have specialist magistrates who lead the investigative effort. If the matter gets resolved, fine, they will uh, see it to the end, but their role is just to facilitate the following of the, of the law in the investigation and making sure that no matter comes before court until all the information has been uh, gathered, all the evidence has been gathered, all the witnesses um, identified. There's no question of uh, um, you know, postponement for further investigations. Now, that's very close to something that South Africa has, an investigation by the police taking the docket to the prosecutors, except that there is a gap there. So if you get lawyers with practical experience, working with the police, particularly in sensitive cases like uh, rape, murder, and these other matters, then the lawyers will tell them exactly what is required, proper statements will be taken, and no matter will come before court and be postponed 70 times before it is heard. That's part of the solution. And it's going to help expedite uh, the finalization of cases too. That's what the, U the, the, the U.S. Uh, does as well. You've got a magistrate judge whose role is to make sure, attached to every judge, whose role is to make sure that every matter is properly um, investigated and case managed before it comes into the role. It will never be enrolled until both the prosecuting authority, the defense counsel, and if it's a civil matter, both parties have met, identified the issues with the benefit of a judge overseeing the process, and issues are clearly identified. The witnesses to be called are scaled down to the number that is necessary, and when everybody is agreed and is satisfied that the matter is trial ready, then together the three uh, groupings identify a date. That is why in those uh, jurisdictions, your America, your Singapore, your Malaysia, and so on, their case finalization uh, uh, record is at 95%. In fact, most of the cases are, are settled because the, the, the opportunity to duck and dive when you don't have a strong case doesn't exist. Everybody would have said, oh, so you don't have a defense because there you are. What is your defense? 
And the judge who manages that process doesn't ultimately sit. So I think that, and that, by the way, the ultimate objective of our case management um, program here in South Africa. It's just that some don't understand it, and when you don't understand something, you reject it because you're used to a certain pattern. So that's, that's what is required. A very tight case management system, the involvement of lawyers, experienced lawyers, not just anybody who has a legal degree in the process, but more importantly, you're going to need to have all the posts in the prosecuting authority field, not these hundreds that are vacant, and uh, you need to check whether you've got uh, um, uh, investigative capacity at the right level. Capacity building is required in the police force, prosecuting authority, but also in the judiciary. Do you have the right numbers? Have you injected the critical capacities that are needed to do this job and do it well? Once you are there, then you go in somewhere. And finally, you don't just rely on public defender system. Courts must have a budget so that if a person comes before court and is not legally represented, there's a budget within the court system. The clerk of court or the registrar can quickly get a lawyer, a proper lawyer for, for the person who is not defended to kick in and defend the person. But that often is resolved during the case management system. That's where we are. No, Chief Justice, thank you very much for that information. I think what is also needed is political will. And maybe after the 8th of May, we'll get that political will. Because if we don't have the resources allocated for these additional magistrates, etc., then we're going to have a problem. Many cases, <clears throat> many perpetrators of crimes uh, go unconvicted because of the police losing uh, crucial evidence, and sometimes deliberately so. But if they've got these people there, legal people with them, then they can guide them along the way. So I think it's a very innovative way, tried and tested, and we should introduce it in South Africa, even as a pilot in, in, a partic in the Western Cape, for example. So thank you for that. And for what it is worth, I engaged with these colleagues because I knew they've had a number of challenges, even in relation to terrorist-related attacks. So the question was, how do you get it right? How, how are you as the police able to move as swiftly as you, as you do? Wow, people go all out to capacitate their police. They know their story. A and that's what we need. Thank you. Commissioner Masugu. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Chief Justice. Um, good morning, uh, Deputy good morning. Judge President. Um, I, I liked uh, the Loama judgment, all of it. I, I didn't like the fact that it was overturned <laughs> in the <laughs> Constitutional Court. And that's because I was involved in the matter and, and it is, we, we won there. <laughs> but uh, the... Uh, <laughs> But the Constitutional Court is uh, perhaps um, <coughs> uh, this, this nation's <laughs> single most important um, uh, development in the sense that it represents the core of what our legal culture should look like. Just, <coughs> I mean, would you agree with that? I agree. Right. <laughs> Now you you acted in this in the in the in the constitutional court. Do you believe that your acting appointment prepared you to play the role that um, the, the that that the constitutional court calls for? Just sharing with us your experience there and whether there are any practices within the constitutional <laughs> court that could be uh, of help. Uh, in the running of our court, so that when you get judgments, or when you get judgments or appeals to the court, to the constitutional court, they are they are they are of, so of sound quality. In other words, it, it, do, you, do you believe that your experience there <coughs> helped you to uh, inject within the Western Cape a thinking in the management of uh, how cases are, are even the production of judgments, the running of, uh, of of records that would be of assistance to the constitutional court. Uh, uh, that, that's really what I want to, I want to know. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Masuko. Um, the Western Cape High Court 
in its own right, is a well-oiled machine. The constitutional court, in its own right, is a well-oiled machine, but it's a different well-oiled machine. So you cannot compare the two in terms of the procedures and in terms of processes. I think my experience in the Constitutional Court, you, 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 you always benefit uh, from your experience in the Constitutional Court, although the processes are different uh, in the High Court. Um, I'm trying to, 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 to interpret your question uh, in terms of if there's anything that I can carry over from the Con Court to the High Court. Is that, is that what you're looking for? Yeah, just, uh, just, just sharing your experience in the, in the Constitutional Court and whether when you, were, when you went back to the Western Cape, it, it gave you, that experience gave you, a, gave you something that you could uh, impart <clears throat> on the running of the Western Cape. And, and vice versa. Yeah. Well, I'm not back yet at the Western Cape. I'm only going back after my constitutional court stint on the 15th of April. The constitutional court has a high degree of collegiality, although the Western Cape is not problematic in that regard. Um, that is something I can take back to the Western Cape High Court. Uh, the environment is completely <laughs> different. And um, the Constitutional Court more has, a, it's a closer connection, much more collegial, it's a family, warm environment from when you enter the court, how you interact with everybody, be it cleaners, uh, be it clerks, be it colleagues, it's uh, very collegial. And that is something that I think we can aspire to achieve in the Western Cape High Court, is a more collegial environment, a warmer environment. Not that I'm complaining, but I think there's room for improvement in terms of that. My experience in the Constitutional Court in, has allowed me to grow personally and professionally. So in going back to the Western Cape High Court, I go back a completely different person, completely changed, much more matured, much more intellectually stimulated. Um, but I would not venture to say, let's take this from the Constitutional Court and introduce it in the Western Cape High Court, because as I said, they are both well-oiled machine in their own rights, with their own systems in place, with their own procedures that works for each one of the divisions, respectively. Thank you, thank, thank you, Judge. Thank you, Chief Justice. Commissioner Masogo. Commissioner Singh, I forgot to mention that the system that she's referring to applies everywhere. We've introduced it uh, uh, throughout the country and we've just introduced it in the Magistrates Court as well. Yeah, the one that uh, Justice Goliath was referring to. Um, Justice Kachali. Yes, uh, thank you. Good, uh, good morning, uh, good Judge morning. Goliath. Good morning, can you hear me? Good morning, thank you very much, I can hear you. Yes, uh, we set together in the Constitutional Court for, uh, for two terms, and so it's good to see you again. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, I wish to, to follow up in an area that uh, Commissioner uh, Norman uh, canvassed with you re relating to your commercial expertise. Now, you, are you aware that there has uh, been some criticism uh, in academic and other circles relating to some of the judgments, particularly in the private law area, uh, that the Constitutional Court has handed down uh, over a period. Are you aware of some of those criticisms or not? Not in the area of private law, no. Uh, are you not aware of, of any issues in, relate, uh, in relation to some of the commercial matters that it, it has considered? Are you not aware of any of those? Commercial matters? Private law embraces, as you know, commercial and dealing. family. So th that's what I'm trying to, yes. to test with you. Uh, 
Are you aware or are you not aware? That's what... No, uh, uh, no I'm, not, uh, uh, I'm not sure uh, which cases are being referred I'm to. I'm not talking been... about any specific case yes. at the moment. I'm just talking about are you in general aware of any criticism, certainly criticism that appears in academic uh, journals such as the South African Law Journal, for example? No, I'm not aware of any criticism. Now, there has been an ongoing... There's an ongoing debate, and if you have an expertise, as you say you have, in the commercial law area, surely uh, you should be at least inquisitive as to what's been happening, uh, how the judgments of the Constitutional Court are being perceived <coughs> or accepted or not accepted in the profession, uh, what, are, what are the problems, are the criticisms, uh, subs do the criticisms have substance or do they not have substance? Uh, surely that is an, an area. Uh, I should say that I'm, I'm particularly interested. I, I, the judges I sit with, you know, I'm constantly wanting to know well, where they got that information from. Uh, have they read, is there a law journal article supporting that? So that's the kind of thing that I'm trying to explore with you. Well, uh, uh, Chief Justice and Commissioners, it's not that I'm completely oblivious to, to criticisms. Um, I was aware of criticism in the Shane Jacobs matter with regard to the split vote. I am aware of criticism with regard to the Gajima decision. I'm not involved. I, I did, was not part of the bench in terms of whether uh, state, the state can review its own, uh, whether an organ of state can bring a review of his own decision in terms of PAJA. So it's not as if I'm completely oblivious to criticism of constitutional court cases. Now, as, as I said, it's not whether you are oblivious to all criticism. I'm particularly concerned in the, with the commercial area because that is certainly an area that I think in the profession and in academia is felt that the court perhaps needs a bit more commercial expertise. So. That's, that's why we are exploring this with you. Yeah, no, unfortunately, I'm not aware of, 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 of criticism of constitutional court judgments in the commercial area. <clears throat> uh, just to tie, tie to, to, to key in there, part of the concern that we have had as constitutional court justices is, of course, this, that there has in certain areas been a push that seems to almost equate areas of the law that stem from the common law to, to the Constitution, almost insisting that they run side by side. Instead of allowing the Constitution to dictate the development of those areas of the law, they have almost served as... Uh, something that restrains the full-blown injection of constitutional imperatives into the common law. I'll give you an example. If you look at the law of contracts, for instance, an ordinary South African ought to say, we know that many people can't read this fine prints, and not every contract is based on justice, you are desperate, you want to borrow money from the bank, mm -hmm. and they, you, you either just sign or they take advantage of your desperation. Mm -hmm. And considerations of real justice are not injected into this area of the law. But what has been the development? And what has been the criticism? The development has been, please, you have signed. The law of contract says you can't interfere with the agreement of two people. That's, that can't be justice. And there is a lot of protectionism around this thing. And the academic writing is more about protecting that system of the law, which I don't think gets as influenced by uh, the, 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 I'm trying to get this uh, phraseology from section 39 of the Constitution, the spirit purport and object of the Constitution. It doesn't seem to inform that. It can inform all others like African customary law. But when it comes to this somewhat untouchable area of the law, 
you in for a riding if you ever go in to try and tamper with it. Hasn't that been your experience? That you don't go there, you don't touch there, there will be wrath unleashed in your way if you touch that area of the law. Yes, Chief Justice, but the court has the power to develop the common law. No, I know, yes. I'm just asking what has been your experience? Have you noticed resistance to touching the common law or have you not? I think, I think there is um, a resistance, Chief Justice. Honorable <coughs> uh, Magadzi. <coughs> Thank you very much. Go good morning, uh, DJP. Good morning. Uh, recently, you have attended a seminar which was dealing with cyber crimes. Um, yes. And... Um, just want to establish what, 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 what was it all about and uh, what will it <coughs> assist in terms of how we're dealing with our court issues, uh, taking into consideration the fact that uh, now we are talking of the fourth industrial revolution, what will be the role, uh, how do we make sure that we factor in uh, this type of new and uh, advent of how we are going to be dealing with issues at court level. Thanks. The cybercrime um, session related more to money laundering and sophisticated ways of doing it. Um, it was very technical and um, uh, what, what came out of that was that a lot of technical skills are needed to try and um, uh, deal with cybercrime because it's a very unique and um, it involves uh, um, uh, uh, in-depth knowledge of te technology, if I can use that word. And um, one has to adopt a specific approach in dealing with cybercrime. Uh, and, and, uh, and the course, in the course, it explained how specific uh, businesses and the network of businesses uh, and, and how multinational cybercrime can be, because you can be in South Africa and a crime can be committed um, outside the South African borders. Um, uh, I think it's something that is relatively new for us to, to manage. Uh, it is a challenge uh, for us to deal with cybercrime, but um, um, most certainly um, it uh, needs to be dealt with uh, through legislation uh, and, and I think it's a developing um, uh, sector of the law at this stage. Commissioner Msomi. Thanks, Chief Justice. I'm covered. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Prof. Thank you, CJ. Good morning, TJP. Good morning. Okay. My question, the first one, is a follow-up to Commissioner Norman and uh, Justice uh, Kashalia and your response to the discovery judgment. Mm -hmm. The GCB, on its comment, in paragraph 3.6, yes. mm -hmm. commented that you need more exposure to other areas of the law other than criminal law. Yes. 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 What would be your opinion on that one? The, first, uh, the second one, yeah. oh, sorry. The second one, the Constitutional Court is highly criticized as well, particularly in remedying uh, the issues that emanates from, uh, from customary law. And uh, I'm one of the critics as well of the, of the Constitutional Court in this regard, because there's one judgment mm. where the Constitutional Court where the Constitutional Court uh, gave uh, the chieftains to a woman, which I am <coughs> of the firm view that women must stay away from chieftaincy. <laughs> so what, what can be done to fill that lacuna in ensuring that customary law is developed in its own context within the framework of the Constitution? Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. With regard to, with regard, with regard to the GCB's comments and my expertise in criminal law, I won't deny it, 
that I do have extensive experience. I have been involved in high profile cases. But one must remember that the Western Cape High Court is a very busy division. And under no circumstances will you find yourself just dealing with crime. Work is divided equally and you get equal exposure to criminal and civil work. The cases that the GCB reviewed is just a snapshot of the cases that I have dealt with. And it's most certainly not crime only. I've had exposure to many, many other areas of the law and that list that they have given, they said that is all they could find is most certainly not exhaustive. It's not an exhaustive list. Um, and if I could perhaps just add there, in terms of that list, uh, Ch Chief Justice and Commissioners, I think I must mention, every Friday we do appeals in the Western Cape High Court, every Friday. And my Friday appeals that I sit in, it's all written judgments, all the appeal judgments. If I have just done 10 appeals in one year, within a, over a period of 10 years, I would have 100 appeal judgments. So that 35 judgments mentioned there, it's just a snapshot of what I have done. And that list is most certainly not accurate and it's not a truly reflection of my overall um, case uh, load that I've had. The customary law uh, question, our constitution recognizes con uh, customary law. Our constitution values it and, and, and uh, acknowledges its worth. I think it's chapter 12, but it's section 211, clearly says when customary law is applicable, it must be applied. Section 39.2 refers to both the common law and the customary law that must be developed through the prism of the Bill, and the right, Bill of Rights. Um, and, and the words that the Chief Justice mentioned earlier, the purport, spirit, and the object along, uh, of the Bill of Rights. So the, constitutional, the Constitution uh, recognizes customary law and allows for the development of <coughs> customary law, not as a subset of the common law, but in its own independent right, as a separate body of law that has worth and value and the fact that, that 39 refers to both common law and customary law is testimony to the fact that the Constitution recognizes that it must be developed parallel to the common law and not uh, through the prism of the co uh, common law. So, yes, having said that, the Constitution is the supreme law of the country and, the, and customary law if there's any aspect of customary law that is in conflict with the Constitution, it becomes a problem because the Constitution is the supreme law of the country. Do you agree with Professor Ntlama that women uh, uh, ought, not to be, uh, ought not to occupy <coughs> positions of traditional leadership in this uh, constitutional dispensation? Uh, Chief Justice, we do have an equality clause. And in terms of Section 9, uh, I, I, my personal view is that um, that should not be the case, but it is a sensitive issue because you are dealing with customary law. But clearly, if customary law says a, a woman cannot ascend to the chieftaincy, uh, that would violate uh, our equality clause, Chief Justice. And to follow up, Prof. <laughs> DJP, the question is, what can be done to fill the lacuna in the interpretation of customary law? Does, does, does it mean we need to have black judges to interpret customary law? Or what can be done so the people who have a background, yes, on, on how these customs and principles are applied so that we infuse them within the context of the constitutional framework? I think infusing customary law in the constitutional framework will always be a challenge because there are perceptions that, that, that customary law um, is, is, uh, um, 
they, that there's a high level of patriarchy in customary law. There are criticisms with regard to some aspects in customary law, with regard to the position of the African woman, uh, that the, uh, the African woman's uh, uh, existence are determined by unequal power relations uh, with regard to customary law. So there are those criticisms, but it will remain a sensitive issue, but ultimately the constitution is the supreme law, and the Constitution will give us guidance on that. And, and it is sensitive, but that is where the tension lies, is to align customary law with our Constitution, and it will remain a challenge. Yes. Uh, thank you, Prof. Minister. No, thank you, Chief Justice. I just want to follow on an earlier conversation relating to the speedy finalization of uh, especially criminal matters. Now, <clears throat> just to give you a context, of the approximately 164,000 or so inmates in our 243 correctional centers nationally, approximately 44,000, 46,000 are on remand. Now, <clears throat> when I visited uh, Roy Hrond, uh, near Mafi King uh, prison, I came to discover that some of these inmates have been there for as long as five to even seven years, um, still awaiting trial. Um, and in one instance, I asked the inmate, what is the reason why you are still here seven years down the line? And he said, well, the police say they're still investigating. And as far as I'm concerned, they can investigate another 20 years. They will not find the evidence against me because I never committed the murder that I'm charged with. Now, this prompted me to require a statistic from the Department of Corrections of all remand detainees who are in our correctional centers longer than 24 months. Um, not too shocking, but concerning, at 979 nationally. Um, now I won't go into the breakdown per province, but in the light of, of this and, and taking account of, of the response I got that I alluded to earlier. Is there a role that the judiciary could play in ensuring that um, this kind of long outstanding uh, awaiting trials get to be cleared from our system in some form or another so that the principle justice delayed is justice denied uh, can find a full expression? Or is this the responsibility uh, that lies exclusively uh, as elsewhere, say between the police, prosecution, uh, maybe some might argue even uh, correctional services, which I, must, I, I may argue uh, is just on the receiving end and is not uh, the, an active, arguably, a uh, role, role player here. Uh, I just want to get your view about whether you see the role of the judiciary in particular uh, in clearing, especially focusing on this uh, thousand nationally out of the approximately 46,000 remand detainees who are in our system for longer than 24 months. Chief Justice, Commissioners, I think it is undesirable if an investigation has not been completed yet that someone should languish in prison. I think as a rule, an investigation should be completed and only then should that person be arrested and then a decision should be made on bail. Now, as the DJP, I, 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 I also chair our PEEC meetings in the absence of the, of the judge president. And the, I, th I would imagine that that would be the forum 
where one would deal with these type of issues. Because there you have all the role players. You have the NPA, you have the police, you have the judges. Um, all the role players are there. And that is what the PEEC is all about. If it is brought to the attention of the P at the PEEC meeting, it can even be elevated to national level, and an action plan can be put in place um, to, to deal with those problems. That is precisely why the Chief Justice put these uh, 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 institutions in place, to avert these type of crises from happening, having people in custody where the cases haven't even been investigated. So I think that would call for a multifaceted, hands-on approach involving the NPA, involving the police, in terms of how they investigate. Perhaps a suggestion of, the suggestion of an investigating judge is not a bad idea, because that investigating judge or person would be able to determine whether everything has been done in this case before an arrest can take place, and that will then ensure that, the, 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 that everything is in order before someone gets arrested and languish, languish in jail, and then the person is being told the investigation is not complete. I, I don't think that is fair. I don't think, I think uh, um, it violates uh, uh, the rights of, 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 of um, uh, those accused of crime. And I think there should be interventions, and it most certainly uh, will be massive, multifaceted, and the solution most certainly will be in finding solutions at the PEC, at both provincial level and national level, the NEEC. Yeah, maybe I can just state that I've raised the matter with the Minister of Police, who has agreed that we should uh, jointly look at this uh, from our side. Um, and I've also asked the department to give us further analysis as to the circumstances of each case, at least of those that fall under this uh, category of uh, long-awaiting trial incarceration. Thank you, Chief Justice. Uh, thank you, Minister. Um, Commissioner Nogesi. Th thank you so much. Thank you. Um, to what extent do you think this languishing in jail is a consequence of the push by the public that even those who deserve to be released on bail should, upon their request or insistence, insistence as a public, not be released in jail? Uh, on bail. Remember, there would be people outside yes. with placards and so on, public platform, no bail, and others making statements, even some uh, senior politicians. We will make sure that this person is not released on bail. And if the magistrate or a judge releases a person on, on bail, say, you see now, these people are captured. To what extent do you think that might have a role to play in overpopulating our um, correctional facilities with people who actually don't belong there. Yeah, Chief Justice, that is now, uh, the, uh, as a judicial officer, we cannot play to the public gallery. We have a constitution, and an accused person uh, is, is, is regarded as innocent until proven guilty and should be treated as such. We have a Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights dictates how the system should deal with accused persons. And um, keeping people in jail unnecessarily, uh, uh, pandering to public opinion, that is not the way the system should work, Chief Justice. Uh, we have a constitution. And the constitution guides us how one should deal with, 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 with uh, those who are accused of crime. I think it's section 35. And um, uh, it, most certainly, uh, the courts are not there to, to, to satisfy public opinion. Commissioner Cain. Good morning, Judge Goliath. I'm duty bound to put to you one of the criticisms you've no doubt noticed 
In the GCB's report, yes. it's paragraph 5.3 pertaining to the case of Pan Garka yes. versus Buerta. Yes. Um, would you give us your input in relation to that, particularly what you now um, consider, uh, whether you've learned from those comments, whether you still consider your original approach to be correct, um, and how you would approach it um, given your further experience since 2015? Yes, uh, the I have I have mentioned the case. It's one of the the three cases that were overturned. Um, I was sitting with a colleague in that matter. I accept the criticism uh, in that matter. Uh, the case essentially uh, involved a divorce matter, an acrimonious divorce where uh, it appears, for all intents and purposes, the husband was trying to delay the commencement of the trial. And my colleague and I uh, felt that uh, the magistrate should have allowed a further postponement in this matter because um, the, uh, the husband uh, was trying to delay the matter. Um, his counsel uh, informed the magistrate before the date of trial, that he was not available and that he had commitments in the constitutional court, so the magistrate knew beforehand that he was not going to be there. But what I've learned from this judgment is um, that one must not be too lenient to grant postponements in matters. Um, uh, our optimal view at that time was that the person's uh, fair trial rights was infringed and that formed the basis of our judgment. And I should just clarify um, that the case was not about recusal. We didn't deal with any aspects relating to recusal. It was all about whether a postponement should have been granted or not. And the High Court felt that my colleague and I failed to consider we overemphasize the one party's uh, insistence on the postponement to the detriment of the other party who was entitled to the postponement. So we failed to appreciate that and, um, and balance uh, the, 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 uh, the facts uh, uh, um, to the extent that it weighed more in favor of the wife that the matter be proceeded with, considering the history of the matter, etc. So yes, uh, I've learned from that matter uh, what I can say, Commissioners and Chief Justice, I don't grant postponements easily after that matter. Thank you, Chief Justice. Thank you, Advocate Kane SC. You, you're excused, Deputy Judge President. Thank you very much, Chief Justice. Thank you very much, Commissioners.